All right, for our beginning, um, we have two sessions coming up. And one of them, you can already see a cheat or a treat, the making of legal practitioners. Um, Dr. Nadan will be here presenting for the partnership today. And then we are looking at XR in biology and Brad will be here presenting for his team uh, today. So I'm gonna immediately turn the floor over and let my colleague, let my colleague take the floor. Yeah. Hello, hello. How was lunch? Food over? Actually had food? Okay. So my collaborator couldn't be here. Can you all hear me loud and clear online? I don't know. Hopefully they'll hear. So it's actually a collaboration I've done with um, a lecturer, law lecturer at Essex University. And also we do some other collaborations on immigration and all sorts of other law things. Um, so a cheat or a treat, it's actually a presentation around the use of chat GPT, which have been the talk of the, yeah, among higher education and which probably will be the talk of the next few years because people are scared or very happy about it a bit of mix of feelings around there. And I think you do also some collaborative work, right? With meds, medical team, right? Yeah. So here you go, some collaboration work. So I'll actually be talking you through, for you to understand uh, the rationale behind the work, I'll talk through a scenario with you, a typical scenario that gets taught in a law uh, first year module and then I'm going to tell you some of our preliminary findings and it's it's taking a um, teaching and learning approach so it's not just technology we don't go and investigate AI uh, chat GPT but we used it in a learning and teaching context and then I'll uh, I'll discuss briefly the problem-based uh, law assessment paradigm shift so actually in law assessments there are Oh, I can be here. I can see the slides here. In law assessment, there are two types of problems that usually we ask students to respond, to reply in their assessment. It's a problem-based uh, question. So we tell them uh, an issue. So, you know, if, well, hopefully none of you have had to go to a lawyer, but if you've ever purchased a house or things like this, you probably would have gone to a solicitor or some notary or something like this. So you basically go with a problem. Okay, you want to purchase a land, okay? And then you tell them, and what you would like to do is you would like to be given good advice, right? Not just someone who's run something for ChatGPT and told you something. So that's basically what we ask. Uh, we usually ask uh, law students to do, give them a real life problem, real life scenario. Like some of you in UK, in other European countries as well, you probably have this policy where you buy something and then you have 15 days to return it. There's a lot of law that goes be behind that. Okay? okay, when you take your receipt back, and if they refuse to give you your money back, that's, you know, you can then go to customer complaint and things like this. And you need the person who's giving you the response to know what response they are giving you, whether that's correct. And then there's also it's a type which is like, I don't know, please tell me about how a contract is formed. Please tell me about how VLE is used. Please tell me about something, you know, very generic, a bit theory. You can just copy paste from a book literally and put some nice uh, references so that nobody says you plagiarize it. Now, IRAC is something that we use and that we expect all law students to know. We tell them a problem that is the issue. Oh, there's like a gap in that screen there. I hope you can still see. And then there is a rule that the students need to follow. They need to make an analysis of your problem and then they need to make a conclusion. And for the conclusion, they obviously need to check law statutes uh, and uh, all the previous you know, common law in UK and all, and then tell you according to this law, this law, this law, this is the, what I conclude and this is what you can do or cannot do. And then there are five elements now of a law of, of uh, to follow in a contract law. So the module I'm, go we, I'm going to specifically talk about is a problem-based contract law module. So there are five things they need to, to we'll look at, which is an offer, an acceptance, a consideration, an intention and capacity. Now, the example that I gave you earlier, if you're purchasing a house, let's say, can I pick two people? You, two? So you go, 
You go to Eileen, say, Eileen, I want to buy your house, which Eileen is selling, okay? You're selling a house. You have an extra house right now that you're selling. Mm -hmm. So you go and you say, Eileen, I want to buy this house, okay? And then she says, yeah, I'll sell it to you. You look like a nice chap. I'll sell it to you. Now she comes and says, Eileen, I'm giving you 10,000 pounds extra, no, dollars. She lives in the US, okay? $100,000 extra. And I want to buy your little house. Eileen says, of course, $100,000. I'm going to take that and I'm selling to you. Now, you need to resolve that because that's a big issue. He'll go to the court and drag Eileen. <laughs> okay, so this is a problem, a typical problem that we actually give to uh, students in law. And we also give things like, um, for example, okay, if uh, a 13-year-old goes and buys a cigarette with mom's and dad's card, actually, if they are quite tall, nobody sometimes asks for ID. And then if they want to, okay, okay. Um, not necessarily cigarettes. Let's take something very pricey. I don't know. Something pricey, luxury, a big watch or whatever, something like that. And then they want to return it because mom and dad said, you were not allowed to do that. That's also a problem and you need to know how to resolve it. And we also expect the students to obviously use statutes and arguments and then engage with the scenario. Okay. Now, our research questions um, what were the assumptions that we took that we you know, had we had to obviously, you know, there's essay type, problem type, problem based law assessment. And then what's the impact? Because we were looking uh, about it from a teaching and learning perspective. And then gender biases. The reason why I'll, I've, I've particularly said gender biases here, yeah, I'll go through it later on. And then the impact on academic benchmarking, you know, when we grade, we've got a table that we have to follow, grading criteria, right? We can't escape that. And then what will be the cheat or treat thing of making legal practitioners. Now, here's a typical scenario. I've done some little graphics for you to understand it because the text can be lengthy and takes time to read. Now, this is apparently a pointer. I don't know if you can see there, but I'm pointing. You obviously will not see there. So there's scenario one. Little businessman guy here, Philip. He contacts Margaret, who's a uh, who rents services. Contacts Margaret, who's the sales director at TechMec, and says, okay, I want to purchase your services. What are your offers? Trala, trala. Okay, Margaret is the sales director now. Margaret goes back, the little arrow, it's going to cost you 3,000 pounds. And it's going to be installation, staff training, plus staff training, and the price, you know what? It's valid only for one week. Now, Philip actually was looking for, in the scenario, was looking for a software, okay, uh, to do some uh, accountancy and stuff like this. Now, at the same time, Philip goes back to his computer, okay, he's multitasking, and he receives an email from Cosplus. So Cosplus, we don't know who was sitting there somewhere and sent an email to Philip and sends the email, email advert, you know, marketing, typical marketing. Here, we're offering these services will cost you not more than £2,500. Now, immediately, Philip says, 2500 3000 I'm going to go for the 2500 So Philip goes for the 2500 calls Cost Plus, calls and make an order, and then he realizes what? They're telling me that the installation cost is going to exceed £4,000 now. Now, if you look back in your life, that's typically some of the scenarios you probably have come across, but, you know, more miniature thing. Uh, you make a decision and then you change your decision, right? And then what happened is, oops, Philip panics and cancels the order. Now, next day, what you would see here is next day, Philip grew in size on my slide, became a bit taller, much taller than me. Now, Philip's now, I don't know what happened. He had a dream, I think. He calls TechMec. He says, you know what, I, well, he actually didn't, didn't get anybody. He, he get, goes to the answer, answering machine. He says, I'm accepting the offer that Margaret made last year, uh, last day, 3000 And please, can you tell me if there is also on-site training for new staff and, and uh, for the next six months? Now, going back to your example of buying and selling a house, sometimes you'll probably go and say, I'm buying this house. And then you'll go back to your uh, notary or solicitor or whatever and say, is there a school nearby, by the way? You know, you've already kind of say you are interested in that. And then, oh, you have other questions that you keep answering. Now this usually, typically things like this, we call that a counter offer. Now, 
again, Philip, I don't know what's wrong with him, but he likes to panic, okay? He panics again. He calls, but this time he couldn't reach Margaret. He reaches the secretary, okay? Um, and the secretary said, okay, I've taken note that you want to cancel the offer. And the earlier messages, obviously the secretary had not listened to them. He said, I'm passing on your earlier uh, message to Margaret, the sales director. Now, the reason why I have actually explain this, taken time to explain this, is this is a problem, actually not so complex, that we give to law students. And in real life, when we want them to become a lawyer, solicitor, notary, or whatever, legal advisor, immigration advisor, or whatever, when you go to these people, you want them to tell you things that will work for you, solutions, not go to ChatGPT and say, hey, <laughs> by the way, how can I resolve that, right? So, now, the question that goes to the students is, uh, please advise Philip whether he's concluded a contract with any of the two companies. Now, this is our grading scheme. I'm not going to go through, through it. It's the typical thing like, oh, you've got, the student has got to identify legal references, have got to identify the problem, have got to understand the problem, have got to uh, reference the right statutes, uh, the laws, and... Um, apply it and follow the IRAC, I-R-A-C, that I had in an earlier uh, slide, the structure, and then language. Now, I've got referencing in red, and I'll tell you why. That's usually, the, by the way, the grading that we use, okay? Now, two things we had to do is, one, we had to put that scenario into ChatGPT, and then we had to modify it and try to see also what else, modify the question slightly. Now, our preliminary findings was when we send the, when we put into ChatGPT the question as it is, as it's presented to students, ChatGPT did say in the beginning that, okay, I'm not a lawyer. Uh, you still need to kind of consult a legal professional. And that's what ChatGPT should do. And uh, technically even, um, I'll actually go for that later in, on my slide. And then ChatGPT, though, did not, know what is Iraq <laughs> because in the question there was nowhere where we asked the students please follow Iraq because we expect them to know they should do it it's like how we expect you to know I don't know you somebody had just gone to the toilet we just expect the person yeah they know they need to wash their hand and do you know flush the toilet all things like this right you don't tell them so we expect the law students to know what they should do obviously chat GPT didn't know that right because it's just taking from the pool of information it's got from the internet, just making sense of the wordings, the words that we've given it. And we never said Iraq there. And then ChatGPT also could not identify the valid parts of a contract, which I had earlier on a slide, which was around consideration, acceptance, offer, and all these things. Did not reference even a single relevant statute. <laughs> Uh, did not engage at all with the content, with the context problem. Uh, use contraction like, you know, uh, sometimes, you know, people would say isn't instead of is not. This is not something we expect students, by the way, to use in legal um, professional offshore writing. You wouldn't be using these things. It's out, whatever. I would, you would write, I would not, I apostrophe T and things like this. And also, um, Basically, we've used the marking grade table. That was a full fail for these scenarios and the times that we've repeated this. A fail as in a strength, almost 20 out of 100. Okay, that's a terrible fail. Now, um, going back to our uh, research questions now. So instructions, uh, what we found is basically what what I did then was add some more instruction, say, please, could you follow Iraq? Okay. And then at some point in time, I also had to add further uh, question, further inference to say, follow Iraq and also uh, please use relevant statute and laws and things like that. Now, the second research uh, question, which was, um, we saw that ChatGPT now, okay. It did a bit better because we were telling it, we were giving it more guidance, what to do 
because well it doesn't have a a mind of its own as such to know what was taught and what is expected of it and um but there was still minimal engagement with the context and it was still a fail a fail this time a 30 out of 100 and still no reference to law now what you don't want to do is to go to a lawyer who doesn't know the laws okay now the reason why i put earlier if you have seen philip was a guy Margaret was a lady, the secretary was a lady, uh, cost plus, just a gray guy, no gender, because it was not specified. Now, that's a reason why. In law, we often have issues, which is if a guy or uh, if a man or a woman goes to, uh, we know that the, the gender bias in pretty much everything, right? And even if we look at, I think on the next slide, I've, I've got it. So what, what I've done later on is, I swapped Philip for Alex, a gender neutral name. Now we, you've probably heard about this, that ChatGPT gets confused with gender neutral names and is saying that nurses are women and things like this. So this is actually coming from, an, um, from a, a previous scenario, a previous assessment that was given to students uh, where a gender neutral name was used. And although it was she, 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 she everywhere, students were just saying he, 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 he everywhere and when you look at their conclusion you can see gender bias now this is actually an example that i got off the of twitter which was uh the paralegal married the attorney because she was pregnant and then chat GPT came with this brilliant idea that okay pregnant before pregnant there was uh, the previous one is attorney but it was still saying paralegal so it got a bit confused because the attorney had to be a guy, according to Chad GPT and paralegal, the, um, um, the woman. And then it was anyway, just arguing and correction. And then it was like, oh, how interpretation does not make logical sense because pregnancy cannot be, cannot be for men. You've seen probably this, right, on, on social media. Now, one example that you would probably be more familiar is he is two famous people here. We know what happened, okay? There was a UK and a US case, a UK case where John was a wife beater. His case was just in front of the judge only and he lost. And then he had a fair trial in US and he was found to be a domestic abuse victim. And that was a fair trial in front of a jury and he won. The reason why I wanted to give this example is obviously um, gender biases have, we do this even, I'm not even talking of AI here. We people do that as well. And of course we could expect, it's obviously AI would do that. ChatGPT would do that. Now there was a review on the abstract, which was why did I only consider um, gender bias and not the other ism, which is not racism, not uh, disability or something like this. That's because the assessment questions that we were using at the, uh, like this year actually had a gender bias issue. We didn't have any example that had a bias around any other ism that's why we just focus on that uh, at the moment as i said it's preliminary research and we'd like to see how this goes um as well now problem uh the paradigm shift one thing we've found is obviously uh there's a say type which is please just go and regurgitate everything you know from the book okay which is easy for chat gpt to do actually and then the problem based thing which is more life real life scenario type okay and we need to obviously be mindful of using and, and encouraging AI in education because it's not, I think you guys are saying it's not, you know, these, we can be talking of technology, but it's not that technology is the ideal solution in every scenario. And then we need to also be mindful of how senior managements enforce technology. I think you've heard it from those students earlier before, and there was another, um, another session earlier from uh, Peter Brand and all, I did tweet about it that you should watch the recording if you haven't. Um, and um, you should be mindful also of how educational technologies enforce technology. We had the, sorry, I'm, I'm keep, keep giving this example because you were saying, you know, you go and then people were like, oh, it's all technology. Was anyone listening to what is needed or were we just enforcing technology because we should, we think we should. 
So if you go on uh, on this module and you enforce technology and you say, oh yeah, the students can use, no problem. Guess what? We're going to actually generate a situation where we'll have graduates who actually don't know the law. And then we'll see the results afterwards. When you'll go to buy a house, you, you're losing the house then. You know, she's going to win because she offered $100,000 more, okay? And we should also be very careful of not setting precedents. Now, why setting precedents? We have common law in the UK. Precedence is a big deal. We still live and abide by laws that were made, even in trading and commerce every day, which we made hundreds of years ago, okay? And um, how am I on time, Eileen? I see you looking at the... Eileen, how am I on time? Eight more minutes. Oh, okay. Yeah. One day. Now, I would have still stay in bed too for a career by, but if ever you want to go into laws or work as a learning technologies into, I don't know, uh, business and law or start to do around that, there's still scope for that because AI is not going to make this disappear. Teaching law is not going to disappear yet. Teaching and grading law, I can tell you. Now, I'm going to actually, I have some examples here that I want to tell you through. Um, when you read, because a lot of people read information off the net, which very often can be misleading. I have two examples here on this slide, which is uh, ChatGPT bot clears US law exam. Yay! Actually, I've had some people, you know, I've had um, people teaching law who were like, oh, but how about this? You know, ChatGPT can do that now. And then, like, did you go and read the research paper? Okay. What says here in bold, it says, uh, ChatGPT often, the bot struggled to spot issues when given an open ended prompt, a core skill of law school exams. Okay. But, you know, there was a title which was like, ChatGPT bot clears US law exam, and people started to get panic. And then the other example is ChatGPT passes law school exams despite mediocre performance. It seems that the bolding do not quite appear are not very distinct. So anyway, so the first line is ChatGPT cannot yet outscore more students on exam, but it ache out a passing grade. You know the grade I was telling, 20, 30, all probably could get is 14 out of 100 now. And ChatGPT Average is a C plus performance. Fell below the human's B plus average. Alone, Chad GPT would be a mediocre law student. Now, the word that's important here is alone. So if a student goes and uses Chad GPT, that would still be pretty much a close to a fail or close to pass thing, you know, 41 kind of thing. And do you want to deal about purchasing a house or if you have liability, you've had a road accident or you need to be represented in law? Do you want some uh, in court? Do you want, you know, students, uh, legal practitioners advising you when they don't quite know what they are advising you about? Now, I have three other examples on this slide, which is media misinformation in law application. Now, this was actually um, at uh, Allen and Overy. Uh, they, use, uh, they use a software, so a chatbot called Harvey. Now, in legal, practice, in legal practice, you can't have just anybody give legal advice. It's actually not allowed by law in some sectors. Like I do some work around immigration and I'm not allowed to give advice, okay? Because I'm not a registered advisor, as simple as that. So, uh, However, what it says is Harvey, the chatbot, needs to be supervised by a licensed legal professional. Now, it's important now you know that license is important, not just a legal practitioner, but the person has got to be licensed as well. And then there was another, uh, there's an example. So Judge uh, Galsha, who's from the First Circuit Court in uh, Colombia, uh, you've got different levels of court um, in uh, America. So. Um, and uh, he actually used ChatGPT, but what he used ChatGPT for, it was in a court judgment, was only basically, you'll see the example he used was actually to check um, if, where is it written? So whether minors diagnosed with autism are exempt from paying for therapies. So this is a type of question, which is yes, no. 
it's not something that we expect the students well, the judge or anybody to give a lengthy, a say type response with logics, and things like this. It just basically would look from Google, from its search engine and different um, texts of the net. Yes or no, kind of whatever is from the net already. And there's another article also that says AI is actually in no way replacing the decision of the judge. OK, what it did here in this case is the judge basically just check if mine is it, it was a yes or no answer it, it, it was not expecting more than that okay and um actually he likened so uh why who wrote that he likened to the work done by chat gpt to that of a legal secretary now that's a huge uh, huge huge difference because a legal a legal secretary is not a legal advisor uh that's actually, uh, I've also given you some example of the earlier text that I was saying about, about uh, ChatGPT clearing exam, okay? So this is actually a question that you will see. It's scenario-based, but it's still a multiple choice. So you've got a man was sued, railroad, personal injury, suffered. Typical thing that you may hear from life, right? Da, 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 suffered, how do you do that, okay? And then you've got A, B, C, D. That's it. You don't ex you're not expecting in this question for a uh, huge answer, huge logical, you know, response and things like this. So that was actually the type of question that was used uh, for the bar exam uh, for chat GPT on the on that model bar exam. And that actually now these are actually elements, tort, contract, evidence, things like this. These are actually some of the elements that you expect someone who are, who is going to clear bar exam to know. And the module that I was telling you, the exam, the um, example of Philip and all, Margaret and all, actually is a contract, is in contract. And you would see that there were twenty five questions of each type. And what it did was, it was very interesting actually. So it did well in torts and civil procedure, but it kind of didn't go well, do, do well in constitutional law, real property, contracts, and criminal law. And re the reason being, I mean, criminal law, if you've heard like a murder case sometimes, that's why there are lots of detectives sometimes working in a case because things can be so difficult to figure out. And um, contracts, real property and things like this, they are, these are actually real scenarios which are very, very complex to resolve and you need deep understanding. And uh, here, uh, sorry, I'll, I'll leave the slides uh, as well later on that you can check these details, but these are actually the research. So the title of media is saying, yeah, ChatGPT is clearing bar exam, but we need to look at what type of bar exam, what type of question was fed to it. And some of my initial notes are uh, like, I was actually looking into, okay, maybe should I look for other things other than ChatGPT? Should I try other, you know? But then I dropped that because I've kind of already come to a, a conclusion based on, on what I've done is, yeah, as I, I put in the slide, there's still a lot of opportunities out there. You can still have a career pivot if you want to go into working into that. And um, and I would like to also keep analyzing other modules as well. As you saw earlier in the earlier slide, there were like tours, there were criminal law, there are other things. I would like to see how it go, how it does because media keeps telling us that ChatGPT is going to put people out of work. Is it? <laughs> and then I would like to also engage the students into understanding because from observation, we know students have used ChatGPT in the assessment. We know it. <laughs> You, but you know, if you put it return in it, <laughs> you don't get anything, right? So that's about it. That's the end. And I've put loads of reading. Uh, and I've also put two um pieces of, of blog that I wrote. I'm I'm very US US in terms of law. <laughs> that's actually two pieces of work around uh gender equity in the US law system, which also kind of explains why um Chad GPT is very biased against uh, a particular agenda. So um, end of the presentation, question time. Am I taking question now or later? Yeah, question. 
Sorry, sorry, this you're supposed to speak in the mic. Oh. Um, what is your institution's uh, advice to undergraduate students um, on the use of chat GPT when they're doing these modules then? That's, yeah, okay. The last bit that you added, that's the answer. <laughs> because institutional advice in general, that, that's why I was saying we need to know where we're enforcing it. You, that, that's why now I want to go and look at other modules as well, because you cannot give a generic thing. Because there are modules like, um, if I go to the earlier slide, um, this one, right? So there was um, there was civil procedure and tort that it did fairly well, okay? Obviously, these are modules at year one, and then there's module at year two, there's module at year three, there's module at, you know, master level. So you, we should be very careful. That's also why I was saying we should not just set precedents. We should be careful also because each university teach different syllabuses. You have one more question. One more question. Yeah. Uh, and just you personally, then, um, do you, uh, are you do you advocate the use of chat GPT as an example of these modules? You know, are you telling students that it's a good thing to use in specific situations then? Or would you just be, would you take a step back and say, ignore it do you find use do you find mm -hmm. it useful for students i suppose if if it's if some things are good but some things not so good if it's the waste of their time to be even in this one i would say no if you were doing a history module like please tell me like when i was doing my life in the uk thing there's something chat could tell me about the history of royal, royal family or whatever okay but if i want to not create problem later on for my kids and generation after when they'll go and buy the buy the house and I'll lose the house because of your 100,000 more money, I will not create the problem now. There are modules and there are specific type of assessment. So um, it's a type of assessment they can use it, okay? But if they are going to rely on ChatGPT for problem-based assessment, we all, the society is going to be in a big problem because law, runs our everyday life in some in some way. So you had a question? Question for the break. Can yeah. we move on to the next okay. presenter, please? Uh, so then I give you. So keep, take your question later. <laughs>